Hello, I'm Grant from Makers Vlog and today I'm going to be talking about how to hack any computer system. Now that sounds like a clickbaity title but it, it, it's actually a legitimate attack that happens quite a lot. It's very common and it is super effective and it's very difficult to defend against and it's called social engineering. So what is social engineering? Well, it's the process of attacking the people, not the computer system itself. So if you have a computer system that is, is very, very, very secure, um, it, the easiest way usually to get in for an attacker is to actually go after the people sitting behind the computer rather than the, the IT systems themselves. Now, the IT systems themselves do get attacked in, in a way um, off the back of this, but it's sort of this is their, their way in. And it can be anything from, you know, uh, uh, bribery, you know, paying someone to plug a USB stick into their computer, blackmail, blackmailing someone to plug a USB stick into their computer, um, you know, to the likes of uh, phishing attacks, which is probably what most people are, are familiar with, is um, phishing and spam. So if you've, you've probably seen um, on, your, on your personal emails, you know, you'll, you'll get loads of stuff in your junk mail of, um, uh, you know, the Arabian prince wants to give you £200,000, um, but you need to send them your bank details and they'll take out a little money just to hold it and set up the transfer and all that crap. That is that is a phishing um, email. That is, a, that is a, um, a, effectively a social engineering. It's just a broad one. And it's what most people think of whenever you say, oh, yeah, phishing emails. And they think, oh, them easy to spot. It's fine. I, I, they won't get me. But that's a broad attack. That's sent out to hundreds of thousands of people in one go. And even if, you know, 1% of them fall for it, that's still a hell of a lot of money they've um, they've got from that attack that, that cost them next to nothing to actually run. So that's, that's a broad attack. But in... A, a company terms, in the terms of an actual infrastructure, you're more likely to get hit by a more targeted phishing attack. And uh, targeted phishing attacks are, are sort of the meat of social engineering. And what an attacker would do is they would have uh, a, a company in mind. Usually this is, this is related to money. They want to get some money out of the company, but sometimes it can just be a disgruntled employee or... Um, in some cases, it's a rival company and they want to disrupt the business. But nine times out of ten, there's there's usually money involved. And what they'll do is they'll pick this company and they will start researching it. If they're a disgruntled employee, they'll already have some of the information. But what they'll do is they will look at the company um, structure and try and see, you know, um, can they get a list of employees that work there? Can they see who's at the top? So like the C-level staff. Um, who's directly under them, who's who's in IT, um, because depending on the attack, they might want to avoid IT. In other cases, they might not. Maybe they want to target IT specifically. So they'll try and build up a picture of the company and uh, what the, the people um, or what uh, the organization in chart looks like in the company. And they'll try and build this up um, to get... Um, to, to, to start planning their attack. And the more information they have, the better. And, and we'll, we'll come back to that because that's, that's an important point. So let's say for sake of argument, the attacker wants to target the CEO. So the CEO of the company, they want to get their, um, they want to get them, whether they want to get their account or whether they just want to scam that particular person out of money. But for this case, we'll say it's a CEO. What they'll do is they'll then start to effectively just Google that person. They'll look them up and see what information they can gather about that specific person. And this is the same whether it's a CEO or, you know, just a general worker in a company. They will start to look that person up. And they'll look for Facebook, they'll look for LinkedIn, um, Instagram, everything, anything they can find about this person to try and build up a picture of them. Once they have that, they can use that to start to tailor their attack. So for sake of argument, we'll say that the CEO is a member of a golf club. And the attacker can get this information off uh, LinkedIn or Facebook or somewhere like that. They've, they've found out that, you know, this person is, is um, part of this golf club. What they would do, depending on, on the attacker, but usually what they'll do is they will then try and or if they pick that as their attack vector, in this case, we're assuming that they do. What they would do is then try and gather information about that golf club. 
and what they'll try and gather is email templates. You know, what what does an email from this uh, golf club look like? Who are the people in the golf club that they can try and pretend to be? Um, so they'll maybe look for someone financial, you know, a, a, a treasurer who might send out an email and say, oh, here, I had a mix up with your um, dues, your payment for, for this year. Uh, it should be all right, but can you just double check this? And then there's a link on the email and he clicks on it and the account's compromised. Things like that. They'll try and find as much information as possible. Information is vital to an attacker for a social engineering attack. In my other video, I talked about um, protecting your social media accounts, and especially for a, a maker or creator who, who does most of their um, business on, on a social media platform or a video platform. Um, and I talked about, you know, limit the information you put out. And this is this is why, because information like this is critical to an attacker. So let's say the CEO, he gets this email or she gets this email from the um, the attacker and they've made it look like it's coming from uh, the treasurer of, of the golf club, which is very easy to do. They can spoof and make it look like it's coming from um, you know that person when it's not. And they send this email to them. He gets it or she gets it into their account. Let's say it's their work account. And they click on the, the email. What happens? Well, it depends on the style of attack they're going for. They might be either trying to put some malicious code onto the computer, or they might be trying to harvest credentials. So they might be trying to get access just to his account by lifting his username and password. Or they might be trying to install malicious code, which could be either doing a ransomware attack, which is an attack that encrypts the computer or the machine, and then spreads usually to other machines on the network, especially in a work network, it tries to spread and encrypt everything. Um, if, if anyone's in the UK, you'll remember that the NHS was hit by a ransomware attack um, not that long ago. So um, it could be a ransomware attack or it could be a bit of malicious code that maybe captures uh, keystrokes, a keylogger. So it would get, you know, anything that he types into his keyboard or she types into their keyboard would get captured. It could be any of those things and probably much, much more. And an argument that always comes up or uh, something that's always always comes up whenever you, you talk about this is they say, well, why didn't IT stop that from happening? Yeah. We're paying all this money for all this security equipment. Why didn't IT stop it? And the, the short answer is it's very, very difficult to. It is really hard to stop a social engineering attack for multiple reasons, but whenever a user gets a social engineering email and they click on the link or they activate something in that email that the attacker wants them to activate, it's a bit like the Titanic heading towards an iceberg. As soon as they hit that button, you're going to hit the iceberg. All IT can do with all of their um, processes and practices and everything they've set up is to try and steer the ship slightly away from that iceberg. You're still going to hit it, but all they can do is limit and mitigate the amount of damage that it does when you do. That is all IT can do, and it sounds very, very shit, and it is. Social engineering, the real defense for social engineering is education. Make sure you teach your users. Um, you know, constantly remind them, do do dummy phishing attacks and, and show them sort of, you know, how complex these attacks can be, and just repetitive education. Um, a note about that education, don't punish the users if you're doing a dummy run and they you know they do something and they you know they click on the link don't come down on them with the hammer of god okay it's education teach them okay you come in they okay they made a mistake okay we'll do a bit of awareness training on anyone who clicked on a link don't make them feel bad about it because you know these these attacks can be very uh, complex and if you're doing a dummy um phishing attack internally uh, you know, you, you can make them look really, really convincing because you know how that company works. So you can make them quite convincing that, you know, um, even attacker might not be able to simulate to that degree, potentially. Um, so, you know, whenever you're training, it, it is really important that the users trust the IT team. There is a bit of a culture in IT of, oh, users don't know how to use a computer. Pff, they're stupid. It's not the case. It's bollocks. Um, users, you know, C-level staff, general users, directors, ev everyone else, they've just got different skill sets. They do a different job. You know, they don't need to know how to use these computers, you know, to the nth degree because that's what IT is there for. And the things that they 
do need to know, it's down to IT to teach them. So if they balls up and click on a link, you need to ask yourself, okay, why are we doing training enough? Should we be doing it a bit more? And in some cases, it can just be the person's having an off day, didn't think it clicked on something. It happens and it's, you know, there's not much you can do about that. So there's just side tangent for any, any IT people, um, you know, just make sure that you're nice about IT. <laughs> you know, everyone has a different skill set. Everyone has a different expertise. Just because theirs is an IT doesn't mean that you, you then have rights to go in and be like, ah, you're stupid, you're a dick. It's not the case. Now, back to actual social engineering. So we know that the CEO in this case got compromised. Now, C-level staff are usually the targets. You know, they are they are um, accounts that are high value to an attacker. IT accounts can also be high value, but sometimes, um, you know, it, it depends on the attacker and the attacker's mentality. As I said before, um, like two seconds ago, there can be a bit of arrogance in the IT team that they know better, and that can be a downfall as well. An attacker can sometimes exploit that and send things to the IT team with the expectation of them going, ah, it's fine, it's not a, you know, it's not vulnerable, I, I know what I'm doing, and they click on things and catch them out. It happens, and an IT account can be very, very valuable to an attacker because IT accounts typically um, are very high privileged, even though in some cases they shouldn't necessarily be. And this is part of the reason why you should split out your admin um, powers to a different account to the one that you might be using for your day-to-day -day work. But an IT account can be quite valuable. Now, that doesn't mean that a general user is not a high value target, okay? Because if you think about it, it can be a jumping off point. So what an attacker may do, say they have a company and they can't get a whole lot of information about the company. They get bits and pieces enough. They've got some users, you know, they've found, um, for example, LinkedIn actually has a functionality where you can search for a company and you can see everyone who's employed by that company. It's a fucking great feature because an attacker can look at that and get a list of employees for a company. What they can then do is send out a blanket spam. Okay, so some blanket attack. Maybe it's semi-targeted for the company in particular, but um, you know it, it's generally sort of broad strokes to everyone that they can get um, accounts for. And what they'll do, it depends on, on how they're doing the attack. But this could either be just completely just a, a spam email that doesn't actually do anything apart from log who clicked on it. Because then that's information for them to go, that person or these people or this team click on links. So they become a, uh, a, a target then and it, the attacker may make a, a more targeted attack for those specific individuals because they're an easier target. Or the blank blanket um, attack might have some malicious code in it as, as well. It might have some payload in it to try and get credentials. Depends on the attack, depends on the attacker. But they can they can do um, all sorts of variations on this. Again, information and, and data about the company is key to an attack like this. So why would they necessarily want a general user's account? Well, as I said, information is key. If they've got access to a general user's account, they can start to look at the company from an internal perspective. They can look at internal emails, they can look at internal systems to a degree and see how the company operates, you know, see who talks to who. They could get a, a, um, a, a better picture of, you know, this person actually talks a lot to the CEO, even though they're, you know, maybe quite a low down manager, maybe they know each other in real life or in real life <laughs> outside of work maybe they're a relative, something like that, or for whatever reason, this person who isn't necessarily on the organizational chart, someone who would be expected to talk regularly to someone in C-level staff, but actually they do for whatever reason. So that could, that's information that they wouldn't have been able to get outside of the company, but from looking at internal emails, they can build up that picture and then they can go, okay, I can't get the, the C-level staff. The C-level staff are all too well-trained. Any phishing attempt or spam attempt doesn't work coming from you know other access that I have. But if I get this person's account who talks to this C-level staff uh, regularly, I could make an email look like it's coming from them or alternatively compromise the account and actually have an email sent from them because your your IT team, whenever an email comes in, from an external source, even if it's been spoofed to look like someone else's 
uh, uh, email, your IT can usually set up um, a, a system where it says this, this email is from an external source. So it might not flag that actually it's not from this person, but it can give you that extra layer to say, mm, how long is this actually from this person? Um, there is there is a good example. I'll try and find the, the source of, of um, uh, the article of where this attack came from. But there was an attack recently um, where, I say recently, it was a while ago, where there was a new assistant to a CEO or CTO, some, some C-level staff, someone who, who had power to authorize payments effectively. And they couldn't get access to the C-level staff's account. Just you couldn't get access to him. He was um, he. I believe it was a he. Um, he was too good, essentially, at looking for phishing emails. They just couldn't get him. So what they did was they targeted a new assistant. Someone new had started. They put it on Facebook or Instagram or somewhere like that. Got a new job at such and such, working for whatever. The attackers seen this, saw an opportunity, and so after the person had been there for about a month, they spoofed an email that looked like it came from the CEO's account. And um, into into this person's mailbox, and the assistant seen it, and the email was along the lines of, um, "There's there's an account. It was meant to be paid last week. Why the fuck was this not paid? This needs to be paid ASAP." And it was a really angry looking email. You're putting the pressure on, which is how attackers get these things and how spammers get these. They put a bit of pressure on you so that you make a quick decision and potentially a bad decision. And in this case, the um, the assistant did. They they paid the account. It was a couple of million, I think, was what was paid. And it was straight into the attacker's um, account through Bitcoin wallets and all that fun stuff um, filtered out. And uh, as far as I'm aware, they were not they were never caught. They, they're away with the money. So, um, you know, spoofing an email like that, I don't know whether their IT team had the system in place where it says this is from an external source. Um, but even if it did, putting that pressure on the person, you know, they read the email, they ignore the banner, you know, putting the pressure on is how they get you effectively. So even if they don't necessarily have access to the account and just use a spoof, it, it can still be very, very effective. But to get that extra layer so that, you know, they don't get any ban banners or any warnings to say, actually, this email might not be right, they can compromise someone else's account. And that's for of saying, you know, a lower level staff member who they've managed to compromise, they can then use that as a jumping off point and actually send an email from someone in the company. So as far as the, the company's IT infrastructure is concerned, everything is fine. You know, it, it's it's an email going from point A to point B. It that's, happens all the time. There's nothing unusual there. And they can then send that to whoever their actual target is. And they can use that as, as a method to spread throughout the company and effectively get as much access as they want. So regardless of what level the user is at in the company, they need to be aware that they are a target. Um, obviously, the C-level staff, managerial staff, um, and IT are valuable targets. You know, they are key targets for an attacker. Don't underestimate a general user being compromised, and that's why you need to have constant training on these things because a social engineering attack is ridiculously hard to defend from. And um, I know that sometimes the C-level staff, it can be difficult to get them to adhere to, you know, the rules and practices and all, all that good stuff because, you know, they're important, they're above this stuff. But you just have to word it the right way. You just have to say, you know, oh, yeah, but you're, you know, you have to do all this security stuff extra than this user because you're so important, you know. You're you're such a valuable person to an attacker. That's why you need to do it for the sake of, sake of the company. You have to defend yourself. And generally blow smoke up their ass. Um, in, in order to get them to uh, to adhere to security rules sometimes. But that's it. That's that's a that's a social engineering um, in in a nutshell. There is so many more aspects to it that you can go down. Um, you know, it, it could, you know, social engineering can be as as uh, simple as leaving a USB stick in a car park and waiting for someone to pick it up and plug it into their computer. It can you know, there's so many um, different aspects to social engineering and different jumping off points that, that you can do. So if you're interested in social engineering, you want to know more about it, let me know in the, the comments. I'll maybe do some, um, show some examples of, of emails or something like that that have, that have uh, went out and worked. Um, so if you want to know any more about that, you'll know, put it in the description, let me know. And uh, yeah, I'll uh, see you later.